Productions. قل يتوفاكم ملك الموت الذي وكل بكم ثم إلى ربكم ترجعون ولو ترى إذ المجرمون ناكسوا رؤوسهم عند ربهم ربنا أبصرنا وسمعنا فارجعنا نعمل صالحا إنا موقنون إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد إن خير الكلام كلام الله عز وجل وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Indeed the best speech is the word of the Almighty Lord The best way of life is the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah صلى الله عليه وسلم the best affairs are the prescribed matters and the worst of affairs are the novelties, the innovated matters. The most noble death is the death of a martyr. The best of knowledge is that which benefits. The upper hand is better than the lower hand. And wailing over the dead is from ignorance. The worst of earnings is the earnings, the filthy, dirty earnings of a riba. The worst of food is eating the inheritance of the orphans. The worst of reports are those which are lies. Abusing a Muslim is wickedness. Killing him is kufr. And backbiting him is eating his flesh. He who withholds his anger Allah grants him reward. He who is patient in calamities, Allah turns his affairs, making it aright. He who is proud of himself, who is arrogant, who loves himself, Allah Ta'ala will debase him. He who does actions to be seen by man, to be known by man, to be heard by man, to be loved by man, the Almighty Lord will make it known of him. Know the creatures, the Allah Ta'ala, the most gracious, most merciful, the King, the Sovereign, the Master, the Lord, 
rose over his throne in a manner that suits his glory, that suits his majesty. He is indeed the first, the last, the most high and the most near. He is the knower of everything. He is the knower of everything. Lord of the seven heavens, Lord of the seven earths, the spitter of the seed and the seed stone. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is in the likeness of the Almighty Lord, nor is there anything comparable or partner to Him. A question. Suppose you learn that tonight this will be your last day tomorrow. Suppose you learn tonight that tomorrow is your last day. In other words, after tomorrow you will die. What would you do? Where would you go? What would you eat? What would you drink? Who would you see? Who would you talk to? What would your thoughts be? What would your living be on that day? What would your actions be on the last day on the face of this earth? It makes you think. It makes you wonder. An interviewer would approach prominent scholars and people who are known for their virtuous lives, for their righteous lives. He would ask them this question with the idea that he will compile, he would gather, he will collect all the answers from these righteous people, from the scholars and these righteous people and put it into a book. All the answers in order to benefit man with. The most inspiring response came from a sheikh by the name of Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Nu'aim who said, there is nothing that I can do to change my daily lifestyle. My daily schedule, knowing, learning that today will be my last day. Because I already live every single day as if, as if it is my last. Allahu Akbar. What a beautiful answer. What a beautiful response. What a beautiful way. What a beautiful end. Living your life. As though this is the last day on this earth. Every single day that you live. How would you pray? How would you eat? How would you drink? You indeed look at every minute second of that day. You will not dare to go against Allah's legislations. Not even for one second of that day. It's your last day. Death is the most certain aspect of life. According to statistics, 6,200 people die in the world every single hour. 6,200 people die in the world every single hour. This is happening around us. We hear of it, we see it, we wash it, we shroud it, we clothe it, we perfume it, we carry it, and thus we bury it. Yet it is amazing that we believe that it's not going to happen to us, at least not soon. And wallahi, brothers and sisters, this is the work of Satan. This is the work of the devil. This is one of his arrows that he is firing at you day after day. He wants you to procrastinate. He wants you to be forgetful, hateful. Why? So you will not prepare yourself for that mighty day. So you will not prepare yourself for that day 
when you enter the grave. A moving story of a man called Bahlul. Of a man called Bahlul. A man who was on the opposite side, we can say, of worldly smartness. In other words, he was simple in his comprehension, in his intellect, in his understanding. It was hard for him to understand things. A Khalifa by the name of Harun Rashid gave Bahlul a stick. He said, this stick, Ya Bahlul, belongs to the most foolish man on the face of this world. If you find any person more deserving of this stick than yourself, pass it on to him. And Bahlul being Bahlul, took the stick. Several years later, <coughs> Harun Rashid the Khalifa became extremely ill and no medical treatment seemed to work. Bahlul came to visit Harun to inquire about his health. The conversation took as follows. Harun said to Bahlul, no treatment seems to work. I see my journey ahead of me at any second. Bahlul asked, where are you going? You know, he's a bit on the opposite side of worldly smartness. Where are you going? Bahlul, I'm going to the other world. To the other world? How long are you going to go for? When will you come back, he asked. Bahlul, no one ever comes back from the other world, he asked, he said. Bahlul said, then you have, then you must have made special preparations for this great journey, this eternal journey. Have you sent troops and army to await for your arrival, to prepare for your arrival once you get there? Bahlul, he said. No one goes with you. And now I have not made preparations. Bahlul said, we should be written in gold. Even though he's against or opposite the world, this much. He said a word or a comment that should be written in gold. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, O leader of the faithful. You used to send troops to make extensive preparations for a trip that will last one or two days. One or two days. You will send troops. Thus they will make preparations, the most extensive preparations. And now you are going to a place where you will live forever. You will never come back. It is eternal, everlasting. And you have not made preparations for it. He goes, here's the stick. Now I have found the man who is more deserving of it. Allahu Akbar. Bahlu became smart lul. <laughs> became smart lul. And not opposite huh? to all his smartness. He became the smartest with this comment. Wallahi. This is our situation. Every day, every night, we do not prepare for death. This is a story that you don't just hear and you forget. No, it is a story that you reflect, you ponder, you contemplate upon. You apply it in your life. Because Bahlul said a comment, a statement, Wallahi, that should be written in gold. You are going to a journey that you will never come back from. And you have not prepared for it. When we used to, and he used to, prepare for a trip in the most extensive, proper manner, that would only last one or two days. When we go to a barbecue, whether it's down to Dose Point, or down to Wollongong, or to any other Balut place, right? How do we prepare for that barbecue? We make sure the meat's in the car. We make sure the sales in the car. We make sure the tires are proper. We've got a spare tire. We make sure we've got enough money for drinks, enough heat beads. The barbie, you got to make sure the barbie's in the car. They have not figured the tomb, they say. They said, do not forget the tomb because chicken without tomb is no chicken, they say. 
You know, we're preparing all the time, preparing, preparing, preparing. But when it comes to our eternal preparation, we don't even think about it. We're not thinking about it. We're not even here. We're dead. We're sleeping. Thus we procrastinate. We forget. We sleep. And say, Inshallah, I will repent. Inshallah, I will repent. I'm still young. I'll repent. When will you repent? We learn from the story of Pharaoh, the accursed Pharaoh. When he saw death approaching him, what did he say? As soon as death was witnessed by Pharaoh himself, Pharaoh, he declared faith in the Lord of Moses, in the Lord of the children of Israel, in the Lord of creation. But his repentance was thrown away. It was unaccepted, rejected. Why? Why? Because it was too late. It was too late. It's not up to you when you want to say, I'll repent. No. You do not know when you're going to die. Death can hit you, confront you any second. So when he saw death, I repent, Ya Rabb. I believe in the Lord of Moses. But Allah Ta'ala threw this repentance away. And as we know, Jibril alayhi salam was going to throw what? In Pharaoh's mouth, the earth. So he will not complete the sentence. But as soon as he noticed death, as soon as he was faced with the certainty, with the truth, with the reality, his arrogance, intrins and sins, his pride, his stubbornness just evaporated and vanished. He became humble, but after what? They say a very, very common, famous saying. They say, eat, drink, be merry, because we will die tomorrow. Do whatever you please. You only live once. So make sure you enjoy that time that you live. They say, adopt your desires. Obey your mischievous, wicked desire. This has been the central obsession of Jehiliyyah throughout history. Eat, drink, be merry, because tomorrow we die. Do whatever you please. You only live once. Make the best of it. This is a common saying worldwide in the, world, in the West. In Europe, and now it's come to the Islamic countries. Eat, drink, be merry, because we are going to die tomorrow. The central obsession of Jehiliyyah throughout history. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, this is the path which is directed, which is going straight into hellfire. This path, this logo, directs you straight into the pit of hellfire. The messengers, the prophets came for one reason. To warn us against this evil slogan. That's why a messenger is called a what? A nadir, a warner. To warn us against this evil path. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His entire mission was one thing. For one reason. To warn us against this evil path which leads to hellfire. And to advise us to recommend for us the path to paradise. As he mentioned very clearly, that hellfire is surrounded with lust and desire, or paradise is surrounded with difficulties and hardship. When Allah Ta'ala created paradise, he said, Ya Jibril, come and have a look at paradise. Jibril alayhi salam came and had a look at paradise and what Allah has prepared for its inhabitants. When he looked at paradise, he went back to Allah Ta'ala and said, Oh my Lord, by your honor, anyone who hears of paradise would not want to stay away from it. So Allah Ta'ala surrounded paradise with difficulties, with hardships, you can say with restrictions, with barriers, with boundaries, things that you do not want to do, but you have to do. Examinations, trials, afflictions that you must abstain from. Barriers you have to stay in. Because if you go out, you've entered the prohibition. 
So he told Jibril again, Jibril, go and have a look at paradise. So Jibril alayhi salam came and went and had a look at paradise and came back and said the second time now, Oh my Lord, by your honor, I am afraid that no one will enter it. And when Allah Ta'ala created hellfire, he called Jibril, Ya Jibril, come on, have a look at hellfire. So Jibril came and had a look at hellfire and what Allah has prepared for its inhabitants. He went back to his Lord. Oh my Lord, by your honor, anyone who hears of it would stay far away from it. Then Allah Ta'ala created or surrounded around the what? Lust, desire. Things that the nafs is inclined to. You know, sometimes your evil desire makes you want to adopt or confront or apply evil. It always sort of stri wants to, to strive to this evil path. This is the path that surrounds hellfire. Hellfire is surrounded with this lust, with wickedness, with deception, with things that you like but you should not like, things that you cannot do but you will want to do it. So Allah Ta'ala again called Jibril, Ya Jibril, come and have a look at hellfire now. Jibril came, alayhi salam, and looked at hellfire and came back to Allah Ta'ala and said, Oh Allah, oh my Lord, by your honor, I am afraid that no one will avoid it. I am afraid that no one will be able to be safe from it, escape from it. These are hadith, brothers and sisters, beautifully capture the test of life. Beautifully capture the test of life. Hellfire is a slippery downhill slope. You know when you slip, it's hard to sort of stop yourself from slipping. Consider yourself on something slimy, downhill. You keep on rolling. You cannot stand after you sleep, if you, if you fall down. This is hellfire. It is slippery, downhill slope. Once you're on it, it's hard to get off it. It looks good, attractive. It promises you instant satisfaction. It makes you feel good, this path. Because it's things that the soul, the desire, the mischievous desire in you would like to implement, would like to do, but you shouldn't do. So once you're on it, it's hard to get off it. Unless you have true faith in the Almighty Lord. It makes you feel good this path. But we ask the drug addict, the drug addict, when he's on drugs, how does he feel? He says, I feel great, I feel on a high. I feel comfortable. However, I believe he is of the ruin that awaits them. This path, dear brothers and sisters, is the path of consumerism, materialism. It is a path that promises, promises liberation from all obligations, from all higher authorities, and thus it makes you believe that you are the slave of your own desire. It makes you believe that you have no Lord except your desire. Whatever your desire pleases, whatever your desire wants, you adopt. Eat, drink, be merry, you only live once, make the best of it. This is what the evil conspiracy out there is destroying us Muslims with today. In contrary to this path, this path that leads to eternal doom and gloom, eternal damnation, Eternal de destruction is no doubt the path of paradise, which is most definitely the path which is uphill. Hellfire is downhill. Paradise is the path uphill. However, as we learn in the narration, it is surrounded with what? Hardships, difficulties, things that you might not want to do, but you should do. But how long are you going to do it for? For only a limited time. The time will end. It will soon end. So be patient. This is why this path needs sacrifice. This path needs 
self-control, disciplines, and needs patience and perseverance, and needs hard work and firm commitment upon the obligations, the worship, submission to your Creator. It needs the sacrifice of temporary satisfaction for eternal satisfaction. It is a pave, a path that is paved by stumbling over blocks and hardship. But you get there. You will get there. Allah Ta'ala has promised this. For every believer, he will eventually go to paradise. Brothers and sisters, what is this world? What are we doing in this world? Are we really enjoying this life? Are we content? Are we believers? Are we Muslims? Do we really love the one that created us? Do we really love Allah Ta'ala? Are we sacrificing our jobs to come and learn Islam? Are we sacrificing the hours in the morning which is most dear to us to sleep in to come and learn Islam? Are we sacrificing things which are futile and trivial, worldly pursuits for the sake of eternal bliss and gardens of delight? Paradise is the home for every believer. Paradise is our home. This is not our home. This is only a, a stop, a station between our life in this world and the life in the next. Brothers and sisters, Allah is the all just. And there is no one more truer than the Almighty Lord. Do not think of yourself as being fooled or oppressed or wronged. Work hard. Love Islam. Be Islam. Live Islam. Sleep Islam. Drink Islam. Stand in Islam. With the flag up high. La ilaha illallah. Let us be Islam Muslims when we die. Let us be ready for this day. Let us not be like Harun Rashid. Let us not be like people who did not prepare themselves. You know, we work hard. Every day, every night, every day, every night. What are we doing? Work, yes. Work is worship. But many of us, our whole life is work. Our life from morning to night, seven days a week. Bro, come to the lesson. I've got work. That's the excuse. We should live Islam. We should live our lives around Islam, not Islam, around our lives. Meaning around our work, our worldly life. Islam should be on top. It is the pinnacle. It is the crest, the highest. It is the summit. It's a pivot. And everything rotates around it. Not it rotating around anything else. That way, you make sure your agenda is, I've got a lesson. Oh, I cannot work. I've got a lesson. I cannot sleep. I've got a lesson. I cannot eat. I'm fasting. I cannot drink. I'm fasting. That's how you should be doing this off. Working. Your agenda. But today it is the opposite. We are not doing this. We are not preparing ourselves. We have not bought this ticket, which is a ticket of death, the one-way ticket yet. But when you buy this ticket, the one-way ticket, no return, one way, it's for free. doesn't cost any money. This ticket is for free. Every single one has it. You have this ticket in your pocket now. Every single one of us is carrying a ticket at the moment. 
A one-way ticket. Not one cent to cost you. But we want this ticket to be first class. We want this ticket to be business class, the highest of class. Not economy or middle class, no. But the way to make it first class, business class, is how? To prepare, to work hard, to sacrifice. For tomorrow we are going to enter that little black hole. Tomorrow we are going to enter that little black hole with no electricity in it, no telephone in it, no mother, father, brother, sister, wife, husband, nephew, niece, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle and aunt. No one at all. No food, no drink, no dinners, no means of comfort. Darkness surrounds you, angels confront you, actions unfolded. This is tomorrow. That grave will be either a garden in, of paradise or a hole in the hellfire. It will be the first stage of the hereafter, the life of the interspace, the life of the grave. If you, saved, if you are saved from it, what comes after it is much, much, much better, much easier. If you are not saved from it, Allahu Musta'an, what comes after it? It is apparent, brothers and sisters, that the best protection against the punishment of the grave is to have the true belief in Allah Ta'ala, the true Tawheed, the true recognition of Allah Ta'ala, and avoid major sins. If you've got this, Alhamdulillah, by the will of the Almighty Lord, you will not be punished in the grave. There are other specific actions mentioned in the authentic Sunnah that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us of that likewise will protect you from the punishment of the grave. They are martyrdom on the battlefield, standing guard in the way of Allah Ta'ala. They are dying because of an abdominal disease. We cite in Surah Tabarak, Surah Al-Mulk, and dying on Fridays. Insha'Allah Ta'ala we will begin those which are known as the saviors of the grave next week due to it being a long topic. The saviors of the grave we will initiate Insha'Allah Ta'ala with next week and that which benefits the person in the grave will be the topic to come after this. Akulu ma tasma'oon wa astaghfirullahu li wa lakum wa lisa'il muslimin fa astaghfiru Allahumma afi anu alhamna ya rabbil alameen. We know that the Almighty Lord created humans and jinn and all creation. And thus when we all die, we are going to be decomposed. Whether we are being blown up in an aeroplane, or by TNT, or by any other means. Whether we are burnt and thus become ashes thrown in the ocean or on earth. The end of us is we are going to be decomposed. As the hadith mentions that every single son of Adam becomes deteriorated and nothing is left of him except the coccyx bone. And the coccyx bone is a triangular bone on the bottom or the base of the spine. And that the Almighty Lord will reconstruct the body from. The one that created it the first time is indeed the one that will create it the second time. And everything is easy for him and nothing is hard for him. Who will be the first man that the earth will quake over, you can say? Who will be the first man that will raise from his grave? It will be no other than the leader of creation, the best of creation, the one that walked this earth, the most pure man on earth that ever lived, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad. He will be the last man to be resurrected. Allah Ta'ala Alam. We did mention last week or the week before that that there are major sinners in the grave that will be punished, correct? Now, 
there are among them, or the major sinners, are Muslims. Major sinners who are Muslims, they get punished. Some's eyes and noses and mouths will be ripped to the back of their head. Others will be built to the boulder, spitting their head open. Others will be fed stones or boulders. Others will be hung with their hamstrings upwards and ripped likewise. Others will have other things happening to them. These are Muslims. Now, the Almighty Lord, out of his mercy, may punish them in the grave. However, relieve them from the evil tormentation in hellfire when they are resurrected. If a Muslim committed major sin, Allah Ta'ala may punish him or he may not punish him. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bi. Allah does not forgive one thing, which is association. But if he gives anyone lesser than that to him, he pleases. He's the all merciful. He's the all forgiver. He's loving, he's caring, he's affectionate, our Lord. Allahumma bestow upon us your affection. So, for that reason, the Almighty Lord may forgive the major sinner. Or he may punish him. However, at the end of the day, the believer will never remain in hellfire. He will be, if he gets punished, to the time that he will, uh, due to his sin, whether, where, whatever it may be, then he gets taken out of hellfire after his time is done. He'll be taken through the river of life, a river, which he'll be cleansed, because he'll be like charcoal, black, from the hellfire. And they'll be known as the people of charcoal. And thus they enter paradise after that. This is the destiny of every single Muslim. Alhamdulillah. Is it haram to read Quran or make dua on a dead person? It is alright to make dua but not Quran. It is alright and advisable to make dua, supplicate for him but do not read the Quran for him. The famous people, Tabarakallah, the famous so-called pop stars and pop singers and movie stars, and they pay tens of thousands of dollars for their grave, and they even make houses, believing that Tabarakallah is going to save them from any corruption or wind or rain or storms and so forth. Muhammad, when they go into that grave, bro, if they're not a believer, Nusallallahu al-Afiyah, Nusallallahu al-Afiyah. It absolutely becomes constricted, constrained, restricted. It breaks them. It breaks their ribs. Huh? Like that. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, scary stuff. It's freaky business. Being an unbeliever and going into that grave. And we heard in our last talk that the predecessors would take their animals, would they not? To the graves of whom? The disbelievers. Why? When an animal would get colic and it makes a constipate. Colic makes you constipate. This is the animals, especially the animals. And they can't burp. Because horses do not burp. Nor do cows. So if they constipate, what they do is roll on the earth. And they roll and roll and roll until they break their intestines and they die after that. So in order for you to relieve it from its problem, if you haven't got any drugs, enough money to give it drugs, dawa, medicine, it will die. So what you do, you take it, or what they used to do, as been mentioned by the predecessors, is take it to the graves, the cemetery of the disbelievers. Because the animals hear the punishment of the dead. So they'll take it to the graves, the cemetery of disbelievers, and as soon as they entered there, it would lose its colic. It would drop the, 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 the stall, the droppings, and then run for its life. And that would save it. It's a mentioning. Allah Ta'ala A'lam if it's true or not. Al Qantara is a bridge in, in the hereafter. And that is, as the scholars have said, after the Sirat, whereby people take their rights from those who have oppressed them, who have wronged them. And that bridge will be the time whereby it will be just before paradise. 
Now, if you have wronged someone in this life, you will meet that person who you oppressed on the kantara, and he will take his rights back off you. That's what the kantara is. The rights of those who have been oppressed uh, get dealt there. That's the kantara. But it's not between the life and so forth, no. What are the punishments for wearing a tattoo? The tattooer and the tattooed are cursed. The tattooer and the tattooed are cursed. In other words, those who have tattoos, place tattoos, and those who put the tattoos on you are both in the same boat. They are both cursed by Allah Ta'ala. Now if you have a tattoo from the past, the past is gone, do not get another tattoo, nor do you expose or try to make you know, yourself look great because of the tattoo. Do animals get judged? The animals do get judged in one manner, and that is if a horned animal uh, gorged another animal, that one that's got no horns, that got gorged or oppressed, Allah Ta'ala will give it horns and it will do exactly as it did the other one did to it in the life of this world. And thus after that, there will be dust. Yes, in the hereafter. In the hereafter. Yeah. Any child that has not attained the age of puberty or maturity, the age of accountability, we can say, that is, uh, he is left under Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala's uh, blessing and he does what he pleases with him. However, we did learn in the last narration we mentioned two weeks ago that Muhammad Sallam noticed a man, a tall man. Next to him there was a lot of children. And when asked about those children, when he asked Jibril and Mikael, who are these children, what did he say? He goes, they are the children who died before uh, the age of maturity, on the futrah. Now, the companions he interjected and said, O Prophet of Allah, likewise the children of the disbelievers, he goes, yes, likewise the children of the disbelievers. Now this hadith is collected by Al-Bukhari on the authority of Samurai like Ibn Jundub. It's an authentic narration as you can see. And we leave it at that and Allah knows best.